How you doing, everybody? <clears throat> this is Yaakov, um, and I want to start a small series called "Restore My Soul." It's actually based on uh, based on a book that we'll be going over, and the point of this book really is to is to understand where we're located in the spectrum of the ups and downs, to recognize how to go and deal with the ups and downs in life, and to have practical advice based on Rabbi Nachman's teachings. Um, and I definitely am, am very, very happy to start this because it's very important for people to hear a lot of this advice. Just to preface this um, starting, one of my friends at work came up to me like, I don't know, like five months, four months ago, and he says to me, he's like, I got problems, he's, he's, he's English. He's like, I got some problems. He's like, and I don't know where to go. Sorry if my English accent stinks. He said, I heard you were the place to go. And I was like, I thought about it. I was like, no, I'm not. Hashem is the tzaddikim are. So I just happened to have bought several books um, on this exact, uh, several books that uh, um, about, on, on this, on this uh, not only on this topic, this exact book that we're going to be starting um, called Restore My Soul. And... And I said to myself, you know, don't you don't have to speak at all. Like I already know this book is so phenomenal, phenomenal and amazing. I said, just open up the book, and uh, you'll have uh, you'll you'll see your own you'll see your you know you'll see exactly what you're looking for. I said, but start with the intro. I said, believe me, it, it gets better. So he's like, he kept on questioning me, and he was like, what? I don't know what to do or not. And the end of the day, after five minutes. He opened up the book. He read the intro. He's like, oh, my God, this is exactly what I needed to hear. I was like, I know. <laughs> Sometimes you don't have to do anything. You just have to be willing to be the one just to give it out and to be the vessel. So here we go. We're going to start. Uh, we're going to start it up over here. Um, and uh, normally I would uh, really just, you know, you know, uh, do my own thing. In this situation, I definitely want uh, the help of the text, um, because in order for people to understand what we're trying to convey here, especially in the series, um, this little mini series is very, very important, and I'd rather not miss anything here. Okay, for the sake of everybody, um, it's very easy to live when things are going right, <laughs> but what about when things go wrong? What does one do then? What does one do when everything in the world seems to go against us? So our sages taught that if a person trusts in Hashem, trusts in God, has every reason to be optimistic in life. While troubles may come, they are always temporary. Nothing lasts forever. Thus, there is the famous legend that Shlomo HaMelech, King Solomon, had a ring inscribed on it, was the, was the, was the little sentence, this too shall pass, this too will pass. Even the most successful people have gone through difficult times, and indeed, sometimes the very difficulties they actually have experienced give them the fortitude and steel to become the successful people that they are. No better example of this is Rabbi Nachman himself, okay, who a lot of information um, we speak about here, and because it's, uh, because it's life-changing, it's amazing, okay? And, uh, and he himself, Rabbi Nachman, came over, uh, overcame many difficulties with God's help in his youth, to become um, the great leader that he really that he really is, the idea is perhaps perhaps best expressed in a story told by Rabbi Nachman. This is a very famous story called the Clay Digger. There was once a man who earned his living by digging clay. Once he happened to find a particularly valuable diamond in his diggings, and knowing that this diamond probably can only <clears throat> get the, its right value. At the right store, he knew, he knew he would need to go to a proper market that was in London, which was a travel, a, a distance of uh, uh, via a ship. He'd have, he'd have to go on a ship to do that. He didn't have any money, so when he boarded that ship, he showed the captain the diamond that he got. And he told them that he would be amply rewarded when they reached their destination once he finds out the value of the real value of the diamond. The captain of the ship was so impressed with the man and gave him the best first-class cabin. The man was in the habit 
the man with the stone, with the, with the diamond, was in the habit of placing that diamond on the table while he ate. Since just looking at that diamond would make him, when he would be able to be put in a great mood. One day, after a particularly very, very full, filling meal, he fell asleep and he left the diamond on the table. <clears throat> when the steward cleaned off the table, he shook everything off on the tablecloth into the sea, including that diamond. So I imagine a lot of us would be frustrated by that right away. When the man woke up, he immediately realized what had happened, but what to do? If he would tell the captain about what happened, he would immediately lose all his status because his, his whole status is, is will be, is when he gets that diamond appraised and how much, it, how much it would be cost. But he doesn't have any money on him right now. He would immediately lose that status if he, if, if he told the captain. And who knew what the captain might do if he did tell him. So he pretended that nothing had happened and maintained the spirit of optimism both inwardly and outwardly. Meanwhile, while all this is happening, the captain had a problem of, his, of, of himself of, on his own. He had a cargo of wheat designated for England. And he learned that if he would deliver this cargo of wheat in his name, he could have severe legal difficulties. So the captain confided in the man, in, the, in, this, in this, the, the, the owner of the diamond. He asked him to do him a favor, and he signed a bill to sign a bill of lading, placing all the wheat in the diamond owner's name, feeling that this would give him some security. Upon their arrival, the, mine, the man with the diamond, the clay digger, quickly agreed. The ship continued on its journey. Shortly before its arrival in England, where he was going to get the diamond appraised originally, the captain suddenly, unfortunately, died. There was the man with, an, with, the, man with the diamond, who no longer had the diamond, now with an entire shipload of wheat in his name. It was worth far more than his diamond. And the man would now be very wealthy, it was all the result of his optimism. Rabbi Nachman concluded the story by saying, the diamond did not belong to the man. The proof is that it did not remain with him. Sometimes we're too stuck in this life we, about what we, what we thought we had and what left us and what went, what went in somebody else's possession. So we have to really clarify in this life, especially the things that do not remain with us, um, they were not. They were meant to be in our hands for a certain time and then go, just like the, the soul itself. Uh, the um, a very famous, very famous story. We'll talk about it later. Hashem gives and Hashem takes. The wheat was meant to be his. The wheat was meant to be the diamond owner. The proof is that it did remain with him. He had his good fortune, his 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 mazal. His he had his um, his his bounty, only because he did not let his misfortune overwhelm him he did not let his misfortune overwhelm him that was the point of the story the point of the story is as much as a person is like no didn't he lie by he didn't tell the truth by saying his diamond no 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 Rabbi Nachman is, 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 uh, Rabbi Nachman is alluding to something way deeper for us he did not let his misfortune overwhelm him and therefore he kept his optimism and therefore he saw the light he was able to see the light at the end of the tunnel he held on with his confidence in Hashem and confidence in the situation and uh, that Hashem is in control of everything and he was able to go forward. If anything, this is the lesson of this book and one of the important teachings of Rabbi Nachman himself. No matter how bad things may be, God can always make them become better. But you may ask, what about a person suffering and dying of terminal cancer? What about the person who really has no hope? From the outside, you look at it and you're like, in this world, doesn't look like the person has hope. The truth is that if a person really believes in God and His goodness, he knows that even death itself is not a cause for despair. Just as God watches over a person during their lifetime, so will God watch over us after death. The one who truly believes knows that death is more of a beginning than an end. And so even the terminal cancer victim has hope in a future bright beyond imagination. And that's what real faith will bring a person, to be honest with you. Thus, it is told that when Rabbi Nachman was dying himself of tuberculosis, which was incurable in his time, the last three years of his life, he told his daughter, Sarah, that he looked at death as nothing more traumatic than walking from one room to another. 
his disciples say that at the time of his death there was an unbelievable aura of calmness and serenity surrounding Rabbi Nachman, as if he were anticipating a beautiful experience. Um, so Rabbi Nachman is a great grandson of the Baal Shem Tov, and he was active in the Ukraine from 1790 to 1810. He was about 38 and a half when he passed away, very young. Although it was an extremely difficult time for Jews, he led his father, followers with a spirit of optimism, hope, and trust in God, which were his watchwords. It is said that it would, should have been one of the darkest hours of his life with his body, racked by tuberculosis. One of his most important messages rang forth. Givalt, which means just like, you're just like, it's like, oh my gosh, never give up hope. This message is every bit as relevant today as it was when it was first uttered 200 and some years ago. So we'll start with that. We'll start with that. We'll start with that. Never give up hope. This whole story that we've read so far is based on this idea of uh, not giving up hope. Because m- most people most things in this life have to deal with testing not yourself. You think it's about testing you, it's about testing your will. It's not about, your, your meaning your will is, are you not going to give up? Sometimes a person says, no, my will is not strong enough. I'm being, te- it's, it's too much, too strong for my will. No. It's too strong for the will from yesterday. Today, you need a new will. Today, you need to increase the will. Sometimes Hashem is asking us to increase our will. He wants us He wants us to want to never give up. At least from the inside, even if it looks like from the outside we gave up, from the inside, I don't care what it looks like. I don't care if the diamond fell in the water. I don't care what it looks like, how bad you, how much own money you owe, how much, whatever the situation is, especially in America, especially the world, you know, we have credit cards, everything like that. I don't care how much a person or how much a person has to repay back to their friend. I don't care how much, you don't give up till the end, till the last breath. Then you show your character, then you show your will. By wanting and constantly never giving up, no matter how horrible, how bad, or how dismal things may look, you show Hashem, you show yourself, more, most importantly. Okay, because Hashem already believes in you when you, when, you, when you wake up in the morning. Right, Hashem believes in you. But the question is, Do you believe enough in yourself to recognize Hashem already believes in you? That's why He gives you the test. He's saying every day, I know you can pass what I'm giving you. And when you do, when when you when you're focused on the information and what I want you to learn, you'll always be a head step in the game. So you'll when you're learning, you're gonna have to you'll Hashem will help you put that into practice. And at first it seems uncomfortable, but you start learning, Hashem helps you put that information into practice. So you're not a hypocrite. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) So when you speak It'll be something that you've actually experienced, something you actually did. And even though you went through something hard or difficult, you'll be able to come on top and be like, other people were worried. And I don't want them to worry, but I'm not worried. And you were going through that situation, that test, in a certain way where maybe you feel like you're supposed to worry because everybody's worrying for you. But you're not supposed to worry, really. It's really, because according to your faith, is, is what kind of life you live here. You can live the Garden of Eden here. You can live going through a test, and if you have that faith that you need, you can feel like you're walking on that narrow bridge, Hashem is with you. Even though the situation is hard, you know He's going to show up for you, and you know He's going to help you. Just don't give up. As Rabbi Nachman says, There is no such thing as despair in the world at all. There is no such thing as despair in the world, in general, at all. In general, okay, and I've heard a lot of beautiful ideas on this, and one of the most beautiful ideas that I've ever heard is, by God, despair has no place to exist. Meaning, in in the world that we live in, right? If you want a person decides for some unreason because things look so hard that they want to despair, fine, but understand it's not a part of creation. It's not a part of the world Hashem created. Hashem didn't create this worry. It was something that He put into your hands to decide 
obviously based on what our parents teach us, what everybody, everybody, what do we learn? Everything, yes, has a level of free choice. Some people learn it from their parents or from their teachers on how to think and how to whatever it is. But warring is not from the side of something that's being created. Like every day, if you look at the Torah, if you look in the Old Testament, it says, and Hashem saw that it was good. Every day, every day, every day is good. Every day has things that are good in it. So when we're focused on the things that are difficult, the things that are hard, and that's just our focus, that's the only thing we can focus on. Even if you can focus, even if that is what you're focused on, just recognize Hashem, Hashem created every day saying, I see the good in it. And I implanted the good in it. So the question is, what are you looking at? Are you looking at something that's decreasing your desire, the, your will to live, to give up hope? That you don't see that good? Fine, but be honest with yourself. Hashem, He sees better than I do. He said the day is good. I, I prefer not to trust my eyes in this situation because if I don't, this is where I break. This is where I think, oh my God, the situation is so hard and that's it. Take your your mind, your way of thinking, throw it in the trash. Throw it in the trash rec- in, a, in, a, in, a, it's a, in a nice way. Be like, I can't rely on what I'm seeing and what I'm thinking right now because it's confusing me. So I really know from inside that the today is good because God said every day is good. Every day he created was good. We saw that goodness. Our job is to see that goodness, to believe in that goodness when we don't see it, and to recognize there is something to have hope in. Go trust Hashem, trust that there is good in every day, and trust that Hashem made it possible for you to find it. You just have to want to find it. Don't give up until then. It's there. Have a great day. Hope you enjoy the first session, first uh, in the series.